data structures is about how data can be efficiently stored in main memory and a set of operations performed on that data for access, manipulation, and so forth. Different data structures have different advantages. The right choice of data structure can impact efficiency of code, can impact maintainability of the code, and certainly the use of memory. Data structure is not limited to this first year course in computing science. It is a concept or tool used in any computer program, from simple ones to more complicated solutions in advanced computing. To illustrate this, I will show you how data structures can help implement sophisticated solutions in a data mining problem. Don't worry if you don't understand everything. The purpose of this video is to convey the idea that data structure is a concept omnipresent in any serious computing science endeavor. And what you will learn in this first year course is a foundation on which any computer program relies on. Let me first introduce data mining. Data mining is a field in computing science that consists of discovering and extracting patterns from large collections of data. These patterns are interesting, actionable knowledge that decision makers um, in companies, governments, etc. use as insights to make better informed strategic decisions. One such pattern is what we call association rules and I will illustrate this in the context of market basket analysis. Suppose you have a large store with many items to sell, maybe tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of different articles. This can be a brick and mortar kind of store or an, on an online store. A customer comes and buys a set of these items. Of course, you don't have just one customer, but perhaps millions, and each buying different sets of items. These form transactions that are stored in a transactional database. A transaction looks like this. A possible ID, a timestamp, and then a list of items purchased. Each transaction has a different length, of course. Here we have bread, milk, apples, and butter, for example. Okay. So what are these association rules? Finding these rules consists of discovering associations between items or item sets in a database. And the rule has an antecedent, which is a, a set of items, imply a consequent, which is also a set of items. So the first item set is associated with the second item set. For example, if someone buys bread, he or she will also buy milk with some probability measures we call support and confidence. Um, or if someone buys bread and milk together, there is a 75% chance that they will also buy butter. How useful is this kind of information? Well, for a store manager, knowing that A is associated with B, when they order A from their suppliers, they make sure they also have B in the store. Or if they put a sale on A, they shouldn't put a sale on B at the same time, but may even perhaps uh, increase the price of B, since they will entice the purchase of A with a sale and B will be purchased anyways. Also, deciding where to put A and B on the shelves. Uh, could be that A and B should be put in such a way to force the buyer to go through the store and perhaps purchase something else they didn't intend to. Or, on the contrary, in other cases, put them actually together side by side to reinforce their association. Of course, the association rule should only focus on the relevant items, relevant based on frequency. So we need to count them. How many times they were purchased together? Counting seems trivial, but it isn't when you have millions of transactions and thousands of different items in the store. Let's first simplify our problem. If you have a store that only sells five different items, that's it. A, B, C, D and E. 
would have 32 different combinations to count. This is called frequent item set generation. You have not just the unique items, but all the possible pairs. AB, AC, AD, and so on. And then all the possible triplets, etc. In general, if you have D different items in your store, you would have two to the power D candidates to count. D is the dimensionality of the problem. With 100,000 items in a store, not a rare case, we would have two to the 100,000 counters to count, which is intractable, at least not in a reasonable time with today's computers. So what do we do? Well, notice not all sets of items have to be considered and counted. We could ignore the sets that contain rare items, for instance. They are irrelevant. An effective algorithm to solve this is called a priori. It scans the database to look for only the unique items that are frequent enough, so based on some threshold, then uses these to form candidate pairs we don't know if they're frequent or not, so we scan the database again to find the frequent pairs out of these candidates. Then use these frequent pairs to form candidate triplets and scan the database again to verify which triplets are frequent and so on for larger item sets until it cannot form larger candidates. So this is clever. Um, it's clever because all the de facto useless item sets are ignored and not processed. The a priori principle is actually very simple. If you know that, for example, pegs is not frequent, then don't even bother with, uh, for example, bread and pegs together. It cannot be frequent. However, there is still a problem when counting. Suppose you are counting the pairs and you have the pair X and Y in the current transaction and you want to increment the counter for X and Y, you have to traverse the very long list of counters to find it and adjust it. That can be very time consuming and you have to do it again and again for each transaction in many of the pairs. Instead, we can use what we call a hash function that gives us directly, given X and Y, where the counter for X and Y is in this very long list and simply jump directly there to increment it. So we don't need to traverse the list. The list would be called a hash table, which is a very common data structure that is built in many languages. In Python, we call it a dictionary. But still, that is not enough because remember, we have to scan the database many times once for the singletons, once for the pairs, another time for the triplets, and so on. There is another algorithm devised here at the University of Alberta that allows you to find the same patterns, exactly the same patterns, by scanning the database only twice. The first scan gives you, like before, the frequent one item sets, the singletons. During the second scan, however, we build special data structures to store relevant data. The first structure is a tree called the frequent pattern tree. It is a distinct structure used to compress the relevant transactions. Then we mine this tree to consecutively creating other trees called a co-occurring frequent item tree or frequent yeah, item tree, coffee tree. And little by little, discovering all the patterns, exactly the same patterns, but in a different order which is not that important. So these sophisticated data structures are not built in the language. We have to design them, create them, and then use them. But here we make it faster than before. If I zoom in one coffee tree, it is a combination of a table pointing to sections of a tree which is not typical tree, but a graph with nodes containing data pointing to other nodes. 
and these pointers, some are directional, so unidirectional, and some are bidirectional. This complex data structure has to be coded and implemented in your program to work, of course. Don't worry, you will not see such a complicated data structure in this course. It is beyond Compute 175. However, you will learn the building blocks and the methodology that would allow you one day to create even more complex data structures if necessary. The same complex tree can also be implemented as an array with dedicated rows, records, and cells. The semantics have to be coded in your program, of course. Which implementation to use? Is it, well, which implementation to use is a very good question, and many factors play a role. Um, each choice has pros and cons. One can be faster, the other can be using less memory space, uh, one could require additional knowledge before it is created, while the other can be built and grow dynamically as needed. So the choice can depend upon different constraints at hand, and these need to be considered. In this video, we talked about the need to use data structures even in complex problems. The purpose is to show you that data structures are in all computing science programs, from simple to advanced ones. You will not be asked to build such complicated data structures in Compute 175. However, you will learn the building blocks that will allow you at some point in the future to devise advanced solutions to complex problems. What is important to retain is that data structures are important in computing science. And when devising a new data structure, many points need to be considered. Reusability, ease of use and maintainability, space required, and efficiency.